It's August 10th, 2020. This is Rook. In the realm of representation, it might be nice to get to a stage where the roles of Iranian characters in films or TV programs in the West are actually played by Iranians. For now, how should an Iranian actor respond when he's told he's not Persian looking enough in a film that ends up casting an Irish actor who needs to be taught an Iranian accent? Navid Negahman has had to contend with such issues for years, but the man from Mashhad has built a solid resume and become one of the most successful Iranian actors in the diaspora, from Homeland to 24 to Baba June to Aladdin. Navid Negahman joins me to discuss roles and representation. I'm Gian Gomeshi. This is Rook. Welcome to episode number 34 of Rook. Chitori, Chekhabar, how are you? I'm excited to have uh, Navid Negah Bond joining us in just a few moments. I think he's one of the most successful working actors in the Iranian diaspora. Even if you think you don't recognize his name, you have likely seen him in something. He is that omnipresent. He is that prolific. How are you? Groovy Shaya. Hello. Hello. How are you? Yes, I'm fine. You are uh, super tanned. <laughs> Did you go to Kish? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Isn't that where people go? <laughs> Actually, I went to Sand Ridge. It's a lake. Uh, in Ontario. In Ontario, North Ontario. Very nice. Yes. Jatun yeah. Hollywood. You have a yeah. beautiful, glowing, uh, <laughs> super brown glow about you. Very nice. Thank you. Um, listen, a few quick items, Shaya. Uh, first of all, a lot of great mail and comments on our platforms about both Bob Akamini and Nassim Varaste, who were on the episodes of our program last week. Uh, we're going to get to those letters on Thursday. Thank you all for the feedback. And remember, you can check out any episode of Rook on uh, SoundCloud, on Spotify, iTunes, Instagram. That's at Rook Media or YouTube. Uh, secondly, Shia, a shout out to someone in the global Persian community who uh, is really doing fine things in terms of paying it forward and supporting community projects. Mo Rahimion, Mo Rahimion and his company in Shufin. So he's in Canada. He left Iran and came to the West in 2002. He's been involved in, uh, he had been involved in electronics in Iran, basically had to start over completely when he arrived mm -hmm. here, you know, as an adult, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which is a story that a lot of people can relate to, yes. I think. And he has built this solid reputation as one of the most uh, trusted folks in financial planning, insurance, and investment fields. So he started this company called Inshufin. But maybe as important, he really believes in giving back to and supporting the Iranian community and culture. So he takes most of all of his profits and puts them back into supporting Iranian community films events, art galleries. He sees the role of community members in the diaspora um, to support each other. And as such, he's reached out to us and is supporting the next couple of episodes of Rook. So a big thank you to Mo Rahimion and Inshufin for what you do for the community and for helping make these episodes happen. Speaking of the next episode of Rook, uh -huh. uh, Shia, on the next episode of Rook, we will be joined by... <laughs> Someone who has some experience. Uh, are you familiar with the David Bowie song, Life on Mars? Yes. You do know that song? Uh, yes. Du but, hey, no, hey, no, hey. no, no. I, I'm not familiar. I, I've heard that Is song. there life on? It's a uh -huh. It's got the des descending melody in the verse. Uh -huh. Anyway, in that song, Bowie asks, is there life on Mars? Right? It's a famous song from the 70s. Our guest on the next episode of Rook has made one of his life missions to answer that question. 
he's also a an Iranian global community icon. Like I'm not going to say his name. Oh. We, uh, you know I, who it is. I, I, yes. So how would you describe who's coming on without saying his name to keep, to build the anticipation? <laughs> I used Bowie. What would you do? Um, I I would say NASA. <laughs> it's too obvious. Yeah. You gave it away. <laughs> yeah. All right. Something to do with NASA. Yes. He'll be uh, will be our guest on our next episode. We hope if he'll still come on now after we've uh, given him this uh, illustrious introduction. Uh, that's our next episode. For now, let's get to our featured guest today. I think he's standing by. Uh, deciding what roles to take as a Middle Eastern actor is precarious at the best of times in Hollywood. And our guest today has surely played his share of villainous bad guys. But fortunately, he is also such a prolific actor that he's played a myriad other characters as well. And he's become a familiar face, an award winner, and a star in the process. Navid Negahban was born in Mashhad, Iran. He took a liking to theater at the age of eight when his portrayal of an old man in a school play drew laughter from the audience. He left Iran amidst the war at the age of 21 in 1985 for Turkey and then Bulgaria, later to Germany, where he would spend eight years honing his skills on stage prior to arriving in the United States in the early 1990s. Navid, though having been called the Man of a Thousand Faces, is still perhaps most widely known for his role as Abu Nazir, the enigmatic Al-Qaeda leader he played for two seasons on the Emmy award-winning series Homeland. But he has appeared in many other TV programs such as 24, CSI, NCIS Los Angeles, Lost, Legion, and Tehran, to name a few. He's also had major roles on the big screen, including in the critically acclaimed feature The Stoning of Soraya M., in Clint Eastwood's Oscar-nominated blockbuster American Sniper, in the 2018 war drama 12 Strong, and just last year in the live-action remake of Aladdin as the Sultan. In 2013, Navid was honored as cultural ambassador during the Esquire Man at His Best Awards ceremony in Dubai. He has also received the 2015 Artist of Distinction Award by the Gold Coast Arts Center in New York and an historic BAFTA nomination in 2017 for his performance in the video game 1979 Revolution Black Friday, marking the first time a Middle Eastern and Muslim actor was nominated in that category. Navid is currently fighting to save the Romani Artist Center and Studios, an artist colony and residency in California. But right now, Navid Negahman joins me from Los Angeles today. Hello, sir. Hello, Joe. Oh, my gosh. What an introduction. Thank you so much. <laughs> that is your life, I, Navid. Uh, now it sounds much more interesting than I thought it was. <laughs> How are you doing over there during Corona time? Uh, I'm doing great. It's been good. Um, I kept myself busy working on the center, uh, the Romani uh, Roman Road Center that we are building, uh, the artist community. So it's been busy. I, I mean, every morning, getting about five o'clock in the morning, coming here, and then going home around five or six o'clock in the afternoon. It's good. It's not bad. You know, Navid, I was researching you over the weekend, and of course, I, I remember you quite vividly from the Homeland series, but I thought, I'll, I'll watch some Navid movies. And, and then I, I didn't know what I was getting into. I didn't even know where to start. I ended up watching Baba June from 2015, 12 Strong, some parts of Aladdin, a few episodes of the new series Tehran. I mean, there's no shortage of choices when it comes to you. And the feeling would be that you are always working and constantly have gigs available to you. Is that true? Um, not 100%. Um, having gigs available to me, I wish I wish it was like that. Uh, it has been my entire life I had to swim against the stream uh, because I was always the newcomer wherever I went. Even when I went to Germany, when I started my career in Germany, I was the, I was the only Iranian guy in the whole theater company and, and an Iranian guy who couldn't speak German. Right. And um, it has been the same thing here in the U.S. The misconception that some of the actors they have is that okay i'm an actor everybody should come after me 
Mm. I should be sitting at home and waiting for my agent to knock on my door and tell me, oh, the people are waiting for you to come and do this project. But, but your, your IMDb, I mean, it's, it is packed full of roles you've taken. Do you feel like you're more open to doing lots of gigs than some might be? Is that what you were just getting at? Um, yes and no. Yes, I am open to most of the roles. I, I never turned anything down unless I don't connect with the character. So uh, for me, I'm open to, um, my gosh, I'm already right now I'm talking to you and I have about um, close to 20 scripts open on my computer, wow. which I'm going through them and I'm reading them to figure out, okay, which one of them is the one that I want to work on. There is a, there is a fine line. I don't do everything that comes my way. I do things and I search for things that I want to do. Most of these characters that you see, the, the characters are complex. The characters, they have depth. There are layers there that you have to discover. And these are the characters that I'm interested in. Uh, I even rewatched an, an episode uh, with you of uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm from, from a, few, a few years ago, uh, <laughs> which I had already seen because I devour that series. I love it so much, and I loved rewatching it. How, how does a role like that come about, say? Does that, I mean, they, does Larry David know of you and ask for you, or is that your agent getting you gigs like that? They, uh, they knew of my work, and the producers, they knew me. Uh, so I was in um, I was in New Mexico. I was working on Twelve Strong when the call came, and I had 10, 10 15 days uh, break in the shooting in my shooting schedule for Twelve Strong, and I flew back to Los Angeles. Literally, I flew back. I went directly to the meeting, and um, when I went for a meeting, it was a um, it was a short improvisation in the room. Um, they gave me an outline. They said, this is the situation. This is what's happening. Okay, go. And uh, I had a five minutes chat with Larry and everybody else in the room. And then the, uh, Larry just stopped right in the middle of the conversation. And she, he said, thank you so much for coming in. I said, <laughs> okay. And I walked away. I said, okay, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I walked away, I'm going down the stairs, one of the PAs runs up to me and he um, says, oh, uh, the car is waiting, uh, just wait in the front, the car will pick you up. I said, no, thank you so much, I drove myself, I don't need a car. He said, no, 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 the car is picking you up to take you to the wardrobe. So <laughs> that, was my, that was my audition process there. <laughs> uh, That's fantastic. And there are directions, the universe is taking you, um, giving you options, taking you different paths. Uh, on the different paths and uh, final decision is yours. So you have to you have to do the work. But you know you're not you're not passive. You're not quiescent, and you clearly must love the work. You know you're you're still despite your success. And uh, I'm assuming you've done pretty well financially with all these films you've done. You're still hustling. It reminds me. Last week we had um, Bob Akamini on the show, the great Bob Akamini, and and mm -hmm. I said, does it feel like work? You know, when you're teaching guitar, when you're playing session, when you're playing on other people's records. At some point, it's a little less romantic than. Does it feel like? He said, not at all. This I love playing the guitar. I love doing this. And I said, is it because I sort of had this theory that you know Bob Ak went through a lot of difficult years himself including his music not being able to be released because he was in Iran and you know then he, then having to sort of escape from Iran he's been through these uh, being jailed for a while he's been through this harrowing journey that I think leads him to really respect and appreciate what he gets to do now and I wonder we're going to get into your story here but I wonder if there's something at work like that with you too where a guy who came to America and lived in his car for a while really gets uh, how uh, it appreciates where you've gotten to and is happy to do this kind of work definitely definitely i see I, i've never done this for fame and i've never done this for money i did it because I, I couldn't imagine doing anything else and i've done many things in my life i've done my you're you're surprised with my acting resume if you get my career resume my work <laughs> resume my cv is is like a, they are not even related to each other and i've done so many jobs that sometimes my daughter 
comes to me and says, well, why do you know everything? I said, honey, I'm old. I've been through life and I've done lots of things and I always did things that I wanted, I was curious about. I was like a little kid who I wanted to learn. So that has been my journey and I, uh, I think Bobak knows exactly what he's doing because he appreciates that second, the second that he's, uh, his, the string, when the string starts vibrating, it gives him life. Right. And that's, that's what we need. Wait a second. So what, what are some of these odd jobs that you've done throughout your life? Because I haven't, I'm not privy to that resume. It's not online. <laughs> it's just your. Oh my gosh. Your, my, my odd jobs. I, um, I've done some. I've done some modeling. Then I worked for a clothing company in Germany. And then I started designing clothes. I, some of my lines, they came out for the clothing company and uh, they I did okay. And then I, oh my gosh, I drove cab. I had a, uh, I, I did construction. I, um, I worked, um, I work at the, at the chiropractor's office. I'm, I'm a licensed massage therapist. I've done Reiki and I've done energy work. Uh, oh my gosh, I, how much time do you have? <laughs> Nabi, Nabi, where did you go? I'm, 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 I'm a mechanic. I, uh, I can check the engine apart and put it back together. So, Which you do in uh, Baba June, by the way. What, uh, what, did you, where did you drive a cab? Um, the, um, in San Diego. Wow. I did. I, I drove a cab in San Diego, and then I got a shuttle. And uh, after that, we got together with a couple of friends. So we turned the shuttle into the Levinson Company, and the money was good. But at the same time, I was kind of lost. I wasn't doing. I wasn't doing what I wanted to do. I mean, that wasn't why I came to America. So I gave everything up. I just took my car, with no share from the company, and I left. You're, you're certainly doing what you love to do now. One would think because. Uh, um, making appearances in Curb and Homeland and Aladdin is a, is a long way from the school play in Iran in the 1970s. Take us back. Tell me what you remember from where it started. You say you had a passion for acting at the age of 10 when you played that role. Uh, did you have a sense you wanted to do this as a career, even as a kid in 70s Iran? Um, I love to perform. Um, and the reason that I loved it was because I was I could change the mood in the room. I was always the clown in the family. I was the one who was uh, who would come and do something goofy to make people laugh. And um, and along the way, I mean, I did that school play when I was eight years old. And then um, after that, a friend of mine, uh, Ardashir, who was deaf, took me to his theater group. I studied mime there. And then when I went to Turkey, uh, in Turkey, I found like a, a teeny tiny theater company in the black box. While I was in Turkey waiting for my visa, I would go there and spend time with them. Uh, then I went to Germany. I, from Turkey, I went to Bulgaria, from Bulgaria to Germany. Okay, hang on, and hang I on. Hang on. For, Let me get to yeah. Turkey and Bulgaria and Germany. In Iran, you're a kid, you, you start doing these theater roles. I, I can only imagine that daily life must have changed significantly when the revolution happens uh, in 1979 1980 in le at least in terms of the the entertainment the the options of what you thought you could possibly do in your life you're 16 years old uh, what was the TV and movie and theater universe like in, in Iran at that time was there even access to American programs and movies did you feel like these options were suddenly gone for you um, yeah, at the beginning of the revolution, yes, it was. And then um, after that, we had to uh, get find the films on the black market. And um, it was crazy. Just imagine you are there and your friends are sitting next to you one day and the next day there's just a red tulip sitting next to you. So um, you don't even have time to think about um, theater or mm. film or movies or acting you just want to survive you just want to you just want to see how how can i protect my my friend next to me how can i be and I, the entire time i was just i was just dreaming i mean my room i remember um it was covered with books i mean i was it, it, i couldn't it was like i was addicted i would walk on the street i would find a book i would uh, go to the store every time that i had the money i would buy a book and i would i'm walking down the street the book is in my hand i'm reading the book and i'm fantasizing about these characters 
so um, I think I'd, in my head I was I was living the life that I wanted to live, even though that in reality I was in I was in the middle of the war. And then the war does happen, the Iran Iraq War, which I know had a, a profound effect on you. I mean, not that it didn't have a profound effect on virtually anyone in the Iranian diaspora uh, who was alive at that time. What stands over out for you? Over a million people, over a million people in Iran died. got killed. That's right. What, what, right. what, what stands out most vividly in terms of how it affected you and your life when the Iran Iraq War happens? Uh, I think I grew up very fast. My teenage ages. I, I don't. I don't remember. I, I don't remember that. I was. I became a man very quickly, and um, we were dealing with the with the situations um, I, because we didn't have any uh, police officers. Most of the adults they went to the, uh, to the front line and. Um, we had options. We could go to the front line in six months and then go straight to university or work as a police officer in the city. So um, I chose to work as a police officer in the city, uh, kind of like a security, city security. And um, it was a, I don't know, it was a, it was a crazy time. I mean, if I, if I want to think about it, and sometimes I'm, um, some of my friends who they went to the front line, the ones who came back, uh, they were not the same. And, um, and we lost lots of them. It was crazy. I, I don't know. Do I even want to go there? I don't know. I don't want to go there. You mean it's, <sighs> it's, it's too hard to, to even think about? It, it is. Uh, I, mean, I mean, yeah, but I, sometimes uh, we, uh, uh, we kind of filter through our memories and uh, we kind of um, uh, we find different uh, secure boxes in the corner of our hearts that we, we we put them in there and we lock them. We try to keep them there. It is there. It's part of me. Uh, and so you just live with it. You were a police officer in 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 the Islamic Republic in, in, in Tehran. No, in Mashhad. That, not a, in not Mashhad. A, uh, oh, not in the Mashhad, government, of course. Not the government police. I was working for, uh, okay. I was working with the police department, with the, um, uh, with the, uh, how do you say, the sheriff's department of the city because they were, they needed uh, the police department, the sheriff's department in the city, Sharponi, Sharponi Shah. Mm -hmm. They needed, uh, they needed people who are coming and volunteering to, to be vetted, to be the kind of night security in the city, because it was um, uh, kind of people were. It was crazy were because we didn't war. have any yeah. security in the city. Um, uh, the, the stores were being robbed. Um, um, the houses were being robbed. Uh, it was a chaos a little bit. So they were looking for. Um, they were they were hiring high school kids to go and just um, to. To gash. I mean, I don't even know how to. It's like a, um, a, a like a private security for the city. And let's put it yeah. that way. That's working with the police department. When you say you became a man in those years, in 1985, you end up leaving, and and I want to ask you about that decision. But in those years, doing that work in Mashhad, what effect did it? Do you think it had on you? Uh, the thing is that you will see when you are when you are in the system, you see so many uh, unjust things are happening. When you are in the system, you are up close and personal. You see all the favoritism. You see everything, all the uh, all the hands that is being greased under the table, and uh, everything that is happening when uh, when others are suffering. And I couldn't keep my mouth shut. I mean, God knows. I mean, my poor mom. At that time, during the, during the war, everybody had a had a book that you take the book to the uh, to the government. They will give you stamps, food stamps, whatever you need, and that shows that you are a residents of this city mm. and this region. Mm. The passport office was in Tehran, and if you wanted to apply for a mashad, it would take four years to to send them a document to figure out what's happening. So I went to Tehran. I took her book, and I forged my name in her book. 
Then I took that booklet to the to the passport agency, and I applied for a passport. And the moment that I got my passport, I I was painting houses, and I was a, a group of us. We were remodeling houses in Iran, so um, uh, all the money that I had. I mean, I left Iran. I had fifteen hundred dollars in my pocket when I left, and I, I just left. I knew that I'm not going to go back. And I went to Turkey. I applied for a visa to come to America. I couldn't get a visa. Uh, then I stayed in Turkey for a while. I found a way. Um, uh, I was working for an export import company in Iran, and the mother company was in Germany. Uh, so I went to Germany. Uh, I went from Turkey to Bulgaria, from Bulgaria to Germany. And when I got to Germany, um, I tried again for him uh, to come to America. I couldn't get a visa. I didn't want to go back, and especially with uh, with the situation that I was there. And I applied for asylum, and uh, I became who I am just because the German government allowed me to be. I mean, mm -hmm. if it, if they wouldn't have given me my uh, my status, I would have never been here talking to you. So, um, Navi, before I, I want to ask you about Germany, but I, I should note, especially for non-Iranians or, or people who aren't as familiar with Iran, Mashhad is, uh, after Qom, is, it's a pretty religious city uh, as well. Is. Were Were you religious? or, or and, and if not, I can only anticipate that that was a way in which you felt disconnected as well, right? I grew up in a very modern uh, household. I mean, um, um, the way that my parents, they were thinking. It was very advanced. I, I remember, oh my gosh, I was asking my, my parents, okay, I was a kid, where do I come from? What is it? I was asking too many questions and one day my dad brought me a book that the, the title on the book was, Where Do I Come From? Hmm. And uh, when you open the book, it's a pop-up book that shows a uh, sperm and egg and uh, male and female genitalia and how they uh, all the whole interaction and right. just imagine you're eight years old uh, at that time it was a, it was early 70s so i'm going to school i feel like that oh my god i have so much knowledge sharing it with all the kids so this was the household that i was raised right. in but my mom since i can remember even before the revolution she always carried her headscarf she she didn't want to be seen. She was very beautiful, so she was hiding herself. And um, this was this was my upbringing. My dad was kind of a Sufi, so we were very I, I don't know we were we were spiritual. We were I I, I don't know I, I don't know if I would call it religious non-religious, but being in Mashhad was a little bit tough because the. Uh, the climate, the vibe in this of the city it was very different. The people were very liberal, but the running government or the authorities. I mean, that was a uh, that was a. Uh, uh, was a uh, was it was a huge source of income for them, right. so they were protecting it hundred percent. And I mean, they destroyed everything around Haram. Uh, it was a it was a it was a different place. It was a place that. I remember it was a church and a temple and a mosque, very in close vicinity of each other. On the weekend, everybody was in their temple or mosque or church. And then right after that, in the middle of the park, everybody's sitting and doing picnic. And uh, we, we used to play football together. And, and it was, everybody was accepted. Everybody was welcomed. It was a very, uh, I don't know. It was very open. It was different. It was different. You you end up, as you say, you end up leaving Iran in 85, um, going on this journey from Turkey to Bulgaria to Germany. And you end up spending eight years in Germany. And, and I, I kind of, I'm trying to connect the dots here because it's quite remarkable because you end up having an acting career in Germany. And I'm thinking this guy is, you know, he's an Iranian kid. Well, he's not a kid, you're in your twenties, but you're, you're, you know, you're a refugee. <laughs> you probably have a heavy accent. Uh, you, you don't speak the language that well when you get there. You don't necessarily have a Western pedigree in terms of acting. 
uh, you're in the land of Goethe and Brecht and, and, and numerous influential linguist philosophers, uh, where language is one of the main elements of the arts and uh, literature there. How do you end up creating an acting career in Germany? It was just... <laughs> I was a uh, I was a pest. I <laughs> I wouldn't let go of them. I um, I remember the very first job that I did. It was Sunday in Park with George. So um, it's a musical, Soundtown. Yes, a musical. Sondheim, yeah. And are you familiar with the play? Of course. Yeah, yeah. Steve, I'm a big Sondheim okay. fan. So yeah, yeah. Okay, beautiful. So um, when George travels through the park, he's telling his story, his life story, and there is a fade in, fade out to every moment. And for that moment, they were looking for an actor who can uh, portray uh, George's feelings and emotions mm -hmm. when he's singing and he's passing through. When I was 15, 16, my deaf friend takes me to his theater. Hmm. At that time, the universe was preparing me. The universe was giving me all the tools that I need. I went there, I fell in love with mime, and I studied with them. I studied very, I mean, it was, it was crazy. Day and night, I was just trying to communicate without words only physically and with my face to see what I can do, what are my abilities. Right. And then when I was in Germany, I went for audition and I got the part. So I have the part, but I didn't have a work permit. I told him, I said, I don't need any help from the government. Just give me a job permit. Let me go there. It took a while, got the permit, went there, and that was the beginning of my career. That was the start of my career. And then the head of the police department, some of the employees, when we opened the plate, they came to support me. <laughs> and um, and that was it. And then along the way, I'm, I mean, some of the plays that I've, I've done, I've done Ken Ken in Paris, which, I, my gosh, everybody was telling me, how did you even get the job? I was playing a police officer, a French police officer. That, and um, you're, you're an Iranian in Germany playing a French police officer. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> just crazy. It's great. The good, yeah. thing, the good thing about Germany was that uh, if you, at that time, I don't, or maybe it was with me. I have no idea. I don't know. The universe has been very kind to me. They didn't care where I came from as long as I was able to create the illusion of the character. And I was able to, uh, I was able to uh, transform myself to uh, become, become the character. Mm -hmm. And so um, that was my, that was my journey. And then I started working for a clothing company. And one day I decided, I said, okay, I did everything I wanted to do here in Germany. Now I'm going to America. And I remember the director of the theater, Peter Norsch, I never forget this man. He has a theater company right now close to München. And uh, he said, I went to Actors Studio. I lived in New York. There is nothing for you there in America. You mm. just started your career here. Why are you leaving? There is no way. I couldn't make it. We couldn't make it. Everybody goes there and they come back. It just it sounds nice. I said, no, I will, I, will, I will try. As long as I don't try, I'm not going to find out. So I left and I came to America. You know, you said a few moments ago, the universe has been very kind to me. Um, and it's it's laudable that you can see the positives in your journey that way but you've also worked your ass off so yeah. I, I mean so you didn't you things were not handed to you so tell me about getting to america and living in a car i left i came here in 93 january of 93 it was january 14 i i, I think uh, I arrived in Los Angeles, I had $400 in my pocket, and my, my, I don't speak English, my English is very bad, not that it's any good right now, but at that time it was terrible. Hmm. I have an uncle who lives in San Diego, so my uncle came and picked me up, and said, I want to stay here, I said, no, come down to San Diego, we'll figure something out. So I went to San Diego, I stayed with them for about four or five months, and I got a 65 catalog, Sedan Deville. It looks like a, a, this car is a boat. It's a huge car. Right. So um, all my stuff went into the trunk of the car, and the back seat of the car became a kind of the, the sleeping area. And um, 
My very first job that I got actually in San Diego, I was washing cars. And I was washing cars for dollar fifty. I did that for a week, and then I, I would. I think I was in shock. I came from that lifestyle, right. then here, and I was very proud to ask for help. And then I was completely in shock, I, and I, I, I needed that week to reconfigure the, the situation. Where am I? What am I doing? Then I started driving the cab. I would park my car in front of the office and. I'm in my car, so um, I can get the earlier calls, and that how, that's how I started. So, how does the the guy who's living in a car and who has this heavy accent uh, begin making a name in, in acting in Hollywood? Those early auditions where you start to get jobs before, well before your Abu Nazir in Homeland. How does it first start to catch fire in, in Los Angeles for you, where you somehow feel destined is the place that you need to be? And you were right, as it turns out. Yeah, um, there's, the, there have been so many other, uh, so many different elements that came together to, to help me to get where I am. I, I think the first, very first step, or the very first gift, let's put it gift, was when I was ki uh, kicked out of college in San Diego. I was going to Mesa College. I was I joined a theater uh, uh, company because I thought, okay, I want to learn. I want to learn what is American style. And after the first semester, the professor pulled me out and said, I want you to leave my theater and never come back. So, okay, thank you. I left. And then they were auditioning for short film. Wait, why? What did you do? <laughs> why I did don't, you? Uh, well, uh, how much time do you have? Well, on this? No, I, we don't, <laughs> I, you, you don't. You don't have to get into the details. I, but you were just like a rebel, or what? What did you? Uh, I always speak my truth. Uh -huh. This is my truth. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean that I am right, you are wrong. But this is the way that I see it. I respect you for your opinion. I, I want to be respected for mine. You can live your life, I live my life. And we learn from each other. Uh, his style and his technique was that he was saying that, okay, the, the goal is to get to the super objective, to the end of the scene. So if you want to get to the end of the scene, you have to, uh, you have to manipulate every situation to get there, to the end of the scene. So he was telling that to a guy like me who has lived his life improvising every second just how to survive right. the next second. So um, for for finals, uh, two of the guys they uh, they had a scene that they had to do, and they were talking to me about the scene. And I said, you know, I think your super objective is the beginning of the scene. Wherever it ends up, it is there. Just go with the flow. Mm -hmm. Don't manipulate the situations. Just live it. So they did the scene. The professor stood up, started applauding for them. Amazing, magnificent, fantastic. How did you get there? And they looked at me and they said, well, Navi told us the super objective is not at the end, it's at the beginning. And that was the end of my I love it. college I love days. It. <laughs> Right in situations uh, I, I, like this, I, 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 I'm, I'm not. I'm not disrespectful, but um, it is. It is my life. I live my life right, the way that right. I want to live my life. Right. There is a saying that I lived my life by. It. You are free to do whatever you want to do, as long as your freedom doesn't take away from my freedom. Gotcha. Yeah. So I respect everyone's opinion. I, I need to explore. This is my journey. If it doesn't work for you, it doesn't mean that it doesn't work for me. And that's how I was able to maneuver through life and get where it is because I, I, I right or wrong, I did it my way. So when is the moment where you where you realize that where you can look at yourself and go, oh, I'm I'm actually starting to be a working actor here in in the United States? When does that come? Um, I, I think that was um, that was my very first project. I used to do light, lots of uh, live Western shows. I did tons of stunt work and live Western because I didn't need to speak English, so I could just ride a horse, fall oh, off the wow. horse, get shot, and do all those things. So I did that. Wow! And then it's very physical work. It, it's very physical. It, right? it was. I was very. I was very agile. I was because of my mind training. I was an athlete, so um, I utilized that. I used it. I used it to just uh, uh, maneuver through 
through life. And then in 98, we did a short film. I did a short film that it took two years to finish it called Boundaries. And that short film, I'm playing a mute trombonist. Mm -hmm. That film went to Slam Dance, won the grand jury at the Slam Dance at Method Fest. I was nominated for Best Actor. That film came to Egyptian Theater in Los Angeles. And um, that was kind of the start of my career. I mean, even if you look at my resume, Right. on IMDb, you will see that my career kind of started in 93. I uh, know, um, 2003, I'm sorry. 2003. 2003, yeah, yeah. You know, I want to get into the kind of roles you've become known for and, and these uh, notions of playing a bad guy as an Iranian actor. But before we get to that, if you'll forgive me, let's just talk about your looks for a second. You are uh -huh. almost always... I went through the reviews. I've been through the definition. You're almost always described as swarthy. And uh, I thought I knew what swarthy meant. I looked it up, and, and the main definition that, that comes up is dark-skinned, and I suppose robust as well. Do you ever uh, wish you were less swarthy? No, I like who I am. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really like it. I mean, this is me. It's, diff it's so uh, I appreciate all my flaws. And all those flaws that from someone's point of view is my quality, is what I am that nobody else is like me. So that's unique. And that's what, what has helped me along the way to, um, to be the guy, to be the guy that's different. Even, even when I went and I did Homeland and all those things, I mean, Homeland, Am I jumping ahead? You're jumping Should ahead a bit. I'm, I'm just curious about <laughs> jumping ahead, but that's example, okay. But but but, I, but on the swarthy thing, this is interesting to me because yeah. it's also really confusing. You know, because you because you do get to, called swarthy, but you you had also said in one interview that you've been to auditions where the director told you you don't look Persian enough for a role. Well, I don't even know uh, what that means. What's not looking Persian? That enough? kind of broke. That kind of broke my heart. That was that was the first time that I felt insulted in the room because the producer and the director they and I the producer was the one who said that he was an Iranian guy. He was an Iranian guy who comes and tells me that I don't look Iranian enough for him. Then they go and they hire an Irish guy. Oh no. They dye his hair, they dye his beard, and his skin, his skin, and I have to coach this guy how to speak English with a Farsi accent. Oh. And I was, yeah, I did it, I did it because the director, um, I just want to, I just want to give the director what he needs to get to get what he wants because I was just supporting an, another artist. But deep down, deep down I was saying, what's wrong with you people? I'm here, you go and you hire someone and you die them to become me. And then I, I have to tell him how to deliver the line. So the only thing that it is is just his face and his name. And he didn't even have that such a huge name at that time. I mean, I don't know what they did, but that's okay. Do you even know what they it's meant? Okay. What did they mean by not Persian enough? Do, what, what, what is it that you, your face I looks pretty Persian? Yeah, well, for them, my, uh, my sharp nose and my, uh, my height and my, uh, I, uh, I don't know. I mean, at that time, I, 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 my face can be a little bit, it depends how you look at it. It might be a little bit chiseled face. So for them, it wasn't, it wasn't what they were looking, the guy that they, the higher it had a rounder face, rounder nose, right. kind of a little bit. I I don't know. I mean, that's what Top he see. What he, he was seeing. You're as not Persian. Topoli enough. Yeah, I wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't. My face wasn't. My face was too distinct. Too too strong for him. It is incredibly. It, you know, it's not just. Um, it's not just offensive uh, that they, they would say that to you, but also it plays into our history of not being not not even being cast in <laughs> in the films where there are Iranians in the films, you know. So, uh, which is something that the been Iranian community that. I've been through that many times. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I I always joke about the 
Prince of Persia, you know, uh, uh, like really you couldn't find it. I mean, I, I'm available. <laughs> I know I'm no, I'm not exactly Jake Gyllenhaal, but come on, guys! Like we can't find somebody here who can who can actually be the Prince of Persia that isn't a, a non-Persian. Look, I have to ask you the question you get asked all the time, and so let me hear the the answer you give to it first, and then uh, come at it from a different angle. So, you, I mean, you have often been cast in roles of uh, terrorists, religious radicals, vicious men, bad guys. So I, I do know this is probably a tired question for you, but do you worry, as an Iranian, about somehow advancing negative stereotypes by playing terrorists or evil Middle Eastern fellas? Uh, not at all. Because I have a certain understanding from the culture and from the mentality. I never played, look at my work, I never played a vicious terrorist. I never um, uh, played. Uh, um, I never played a character that would. Um, I never played the character irresponsibly. Uh, Abu Nazir was a character that got me invited to White House. Got got me invited to uh, Shimon Peres's house in Israel. And wherever I went in Israel, everybody came up to me. Oh my gosh, you are Abu Nazir. I'm so sorry for your son. Let me explain so, to people that you, 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 you end up getting this big role in Homeland, for those who haven't seen it, the series Homeland, your breakthrough, and, and which captures the attention not only of, uh, of the White House and, and Shimon Peres, but critics who love you and love it. You play Abu Nazir, who is an Islamist terrorist mastermind seeking revenge on the U.S. for a drone strike that kills his young son. And I have to say, you do take on the stereotype of this evil jihadist here and give him a complexity that is is rarely seen. There's even tender moments between him and Brody. So that's what you're you're referring to, yes? Yes, yes. And um, see, the thing is that um, not that I'm agreeing with some of their methods, and I believe that some methods out there are just being manipulated and planned by bigger power, by the bigger governments. And they are just manipulating people and they are taking advantage of their uh, of someone's moral values. But um, for me, I never, I've never played a villain. I have always played a man who is fighting for what he believes in, right or wrong, what he believes in. And is the audience's uh, choice. Uh, they can choose, they can decide which way, how they want to see this character. I never judge my characters. And I don't think, um, I don't think that you will be able to do justice when you, when I, when I do the work, I separate myself from the character and I let the character take over. So I'm not the one who is pulling strings and manipulating the character. I just let the character be. And that's what you see. I mean, but, it is. But Navid, if the series you're in or the movie you're in mm -hmm. is, is doing some injustice or, or, or advancing some stereotypes, you know, those first two seasons of Homeland, you might, you'll remember this. Were, yeah. were criticized for being hard on Middle Easterners and Muslims and advancing stereotypes in general. I had the the great fortune uh, to interview Mandy Patinkin during that time. We had a long interview. He would place Saul Barents in, 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 in Homeland. And he, his, his take on it was pretty refreshing. He said uh, he welcomed people talking about the problems with the series that they had with Homeland. And he really wanted folks to start conversations about what could be done better and to have conversations about uh, these, these issues and these people in these roles and and that were I mean, he saw homeland as almost a um as a vehicle for having discussion um does that resonate uh, for exactly you? that was that was it mandy and i mandy and i when we were in israel we traveled we went to the, uh we crossed the red line we went uh we went well, we traveled around israel we went to um to palestine and it, it's just with different organizations see that uh, the problem that we have is always us and them there is no us and them it's just us let's understand us and then we can figure out the problem 
that is that is what's happening and that's what homeland was homeland for itself at the time that it came out it was a revolutionary show yes for a history of american television you have never had a show like that before it was a show that it was showing both point of views and allowing the audience to feel who these people are yeah my gosh, I, I said that to a friend of mine. We were, we were talking, they were, they were looking at me and they were saying, so how does it feel to play a terrorist? I said, I never played a terrorist. I was playing the freedom fighter. Let me ask you a question. You're sitting at home with your family. Somebody kicked the door with the gun, comes in and put all you guys face down on the floor. Who is that person? Is that person a terrorist? Are you asking me? Yeah, I'm asking you. Uh, well, In, that, how would you describe that person? That person, the word terrorist is somebody who creates fear. Ter if sure, fear terrorizes sure, you. absolutely, yeah. So that person would be a terrorist coming into your home, putting you and your family face down and start yelling at you and screaming at you and kicking you and putting you in the corner or do whatever he is doing. Is that true? Absolutely. Would you, you agree make that with that argument? Absolutely. So, yeah. would it make it would it make a difference if that person who's coming in and doing that is wearing a, a United States uh, military outfit or United States uh, police uniform? Uh, well, now well, that not, person not is to a me. hero. Not is to that, me. Not to me. It would. See, that's but, what, <laughs> <laughs> but it would to don't some get people. Me, don't get me started. <laughs> no, but Navid, here's this is the thing. The, the part of the argument is not just whether, because I don't think no one said, uh, in, in fact, I, I haven't read anywhere that, you know, Navid Negapon didn't do a good job of playing Abu Nazir. You know, you were, in fact, you're lauded for your acting in that, in Homeland in particular. Um, what what the argument would be is, if, if an American sitting in Kentucky doesn't know anything about Iranians and, and you know, is, fee, is being fed some propaganda about how all Iranians are barbarians and our terrorists and all of this and then doesn't see positive portrayals of a Middle Eastern person that it will compound those stereotypes that's the fear right that's the concern I agree with you 100% and that comes um, um, that is the responsibility of the creators writers and the actors there have been projects that I walked away when I saw that the creative side the creative team are blind to those sensitive issues there have been projects big projects that i walked away from them projects that they anybody else would have loved to work on them and mm -hmm. i had some friends who they went and they worked on it but there are projects that you jump in you go in and you talk see if i don't take these projects it means that i have no control over the outcome of the project right I will sit on the back, sit on sideline and I'm looking at them and I say, oh, no, they did it wrong. They shouldn't have done this. Oh, why did they say this? But if I'm going in and I say, guys, let me play along with you. You want to create this guy? Okay, let's create it. There's a difference between inshallah and mashallah. Hmm. So you guys need to first be clear what you want to say. If I step away and somebody else goes there, a Latino actor or an actor who's not even familiar with the culture goes and plays this role, he's going to do what the producers are asking him to do. Right. And that is something that we should be afraid of. Uh, that, that's Alfred Molina in Not Without My Daughter. I mean, that's, yes. you know, not to blame him, but that's exactly the case, right? Playing an Iranian he guy. He did a fantastic job as an actor, sure. but was he, did he have the heart? Right, right. Was he, was he, See, these are, the, these are the things that we need to be careful. There have been projects, great stories, but those great stories, they were destroyed. But because you, the people but who were doing it, they didn't know what they were doing. One of them was September's of Shiraz. The book was interesting. It was a very interesting uh, book, but that was the very first movie that forever, I mean, I'd never done this before. I, I watched 10 minutes of it and I turned it off. I said, this is, I don't even want to see that. So, the thing is, the thing is that we are, uh, we have projects, for example, when I worked on Brothers, mm. I walked into the room and Jim Sheridan, he is a, uh, he's a madman. I love him, but he's a madman. I was in the room and when I auditioned, 
all of a sudden he got up, he came up to me and said, what did you do? I said, yeah, I, the lines that they were on the script, I mean, that's what I did. He said, no, 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 you did something different. What did you do? I said, well, um, the, the way that you guys wrote him is a madman. This man has a family the same way as you do. This man is valuing his country. This man is fighting for what he believes in. So that wasn't written in the script. That's what I added to the, to the character. He said, okay, let's do it again. He walked out of the room and I, I'm standing there. And I never forget, Avi Kaufman was in the room. She was the casting director. And Avi told me, um, I said, well, I guess I'm done. She said, no, oh, thank you so much for coming in. Yes, you are done. Thank you. I'm walking outside. The moment that I come out of the room, Jim Sheridan grabs my hand and said, come with me. He takes me into the conference room and he calls and he says, ask the writer to come in. He stayed there in the room with me. He poured me a cup of coffee. We sat down, we talked about the character until the writer came in and said, this was my problem with the script. Let's fix it. Why don't you guys listen to each other? Let him tell you a story. Now, the character that you're seeing in Brothers, that character is a character that we were able to save because originally that character was written just as a vicious I got you. madman who is just shooting people. I got you. But you can't control the, the well, everything that happens in a series, and in, and particularly, uh, you know, you, the Iranian community can be uh, uh, sensitive and have a number of different opinions depending on who you ask, as you know. So, I mean, <laughs> you're in a series right now called Tehran. And it's drawing some criticism from different corners, including some Iranians who say it's great, others who say it's not representative of Iranians. How do you shut out the chatter? How do you deal with those kinds of sentiments in a in a series that ultimately you can't really control? I mean, you're you can control your role, but you're not. You know, you can't run the series, right? Hundred percent. That's true. All I can do is um, kind of control my my storyline. And not control, just contribute to my storyline. Um, to be very honest with you, I think that they did a very good job on Tehran, telling a story. There are some flaws in there because of lack of knowledge, but at the same time, what they are presenting, it just kind of started a dialogue. It started a conversation. And uh, what they meant, they really meant it well. I mean, the director himself, he went and he studied, he learned Farsi because he didn't want to misunderstand what's being said on the set. For example, um, uh, Neve, Neve speaks Farsi. Neve went and studied for six, seven months to speak Farsi. Hmm. Uh, some of the issues, some of the issues with that is that, of course, it's someone else's point of view, what they see, but it's also because of, um, uh, the lack of correct information that's coming out of the country or the way that the people are seeing it. We have to work on that. But in general, I don't think that I don't think that that film makes the Iranians look bad. Actually, it shows if you look through Neve's character, if you look through her eyes, this girl who left Iran was kicked out of Iran, went to Israel, was raised in Israel, now, coming back to Iran, he's coming to defend Israel and he's coming to destroy the nuclear power plant, Iranian nuclear power plant. When she comes to Iran, she rediscovers, she rediscovers her love. She sees the country for what it is, not what people in Israel told her what it is. Well, honestly, I think we would need to do, uh, I mean, we probably will do a whole episode one day on Rook about, about Tehran because there are a lot of different opinions about that. But in, but in terms of the way you, uh, you know, on the other side of the spectrum, I watched another film of yours over the weekend as well, Liberation, which is this mm -hmm. short film in which you play the Shah of Iran, the late Shah of Iran. And I was watching you think, which I think you do an amazing job of, Yeah, but I think... 
this guy, this is a heavy part to play because you have to know, being Iranian yourself, that pretty much anything you do with this role is going to draw a different set of opinions from different people, right? Depending on how they feel about the Shah, depending on how, you know, how, how your face moves in a certain scene. Uh, tell me about accepting a role like that and that kind of responsibility. That role was one of the scariest roles that I played. I'm not going to go into details, but let me put it this way, that I studied for that role, I studied for that character over six or seven months. I believe it. And I went and I, um, I went to New York. I was able to meet with some people who were very close to Late Shaw. I was able to see some of the personal videos, some of the personal pictures, we had to um, uh, readjust some of the scenes in the movie because I didn't want to, um, I, I wanted to show his heart. And to be very honest with you, after studying him for six months, going through all the documents that I found over all the materials, all the personal videos, home videos, some of the interviews, some of the personal interviews that you haven't even seen it, it never came out. And when I, when I saw that, I said, it's a shame that Iranian people never got to know him the way I got to know him. Mm. Because if they knew who he was inside and what what his dreams were and what he was planning to do and what his plans were i don't think that the revolution would have ever happened unfortunately we never got to know him for who he was the things that he has done the things that he was planning to do and how um how modern truly how modern our country was when when he was saying Iran a man, uh, it's truly he it was he was he was truly passionate and he loved it, and whatever he was doing, he was doing it for, for bettering the country and bettering the the situation. And it's sad that uh, people never got to know him. Navid, what did you hear from Iranians after uh, you say that was a scary role after playing the Shah? What um, what surprised you, or what, or perhaps, or, or, or what did you hear in general from Iranians after liberation came out? I got lots of hugs. I got lots of hugs at the screenings. The people that would come up to me and they give, they would give me a hug, and a, a genuine hug. Uh, that was a that was a film that I won the best actor for it. So uh, that was one of the one of the characters that I really it touched me. We uh, it, it was an interesting journey. I met him when I was five years old. Huh. I welcomed him into Mashhad, hmm. and uh, Shaban was supposed to be there, and she never showed up. So. Uh, after we did the screening, after the film was out, and then I got, um, uh, Kambis, uh, Kambis called me, Kambis Althabaya, and said that uh, um, Shabon is coming to town, she wants to meet with you and come to the event. So um, I went to just show my respect to say hi. When I was there, I kind of stood in the back and let her do her thing and everybody else. And then she looked at me it was such a warmth in her eyes. And then she came up to me and she said, hmm. I, you, you were the one who played him. Yes. I said, um, I said, yes. And um, it was a beautiful and warm moment. And the way that she was, um, she also gave us her validation because the film was very, it was truly, it was showing his heart. I don't know. You saw the film. I don't. I, I don't like to talk about um, about my work, how it's affecting people, or how the people are seeing it. You should tell me what you. Well, saw, I will tell you, you. I will tell you that when you talk about bringing a nuance to characters, so that they are more than a a cardboard cutout or some sort of stereotype, I I think you accomplished that with. I mean, I think you've done it with Abu Nazir. I think you did it. You've done it repeatedly. But I do think with the Shah of Iran, it's, it's a short film. You don't even. It's not. And and he doesn't even speak that much throughout this film, but you communicate a lot. 
you communicate a yeah. lot and it's a uh, it's an emotional film to watch um, I have to say something I'm, I'm sorry uh, our community the Persian community we are um, we are always nitpicking on everybody else and what people are doing how the people are uh, uh, are uh, presenting us in the wrong way and um, but when it comes to action uh, most of the people they they sit back and uh, they don't they don't do anything yeah. I mean it happened even with 300 when 300 came out oh well, why do they re represent the Iranians like this uh, but we have so many powerful Iranians here in we don't have a community. We don't have a voice. We, for example, for uh, oh my gosh, for for liberation, that was supposed to be a feature film, and nobody supported us. Nobody came to help to to make it happen. That was supposed to be just a presentation, just an idea of what it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And then um, for other projects, we have been uh, that have been pro even Babaju some of the Iranian people here who our budget for Babajun was 1.1 1 .1 originally it went to 1.5 because we had some uh, problems uh, difficulties on the set but um, it, that money would have been the lint on the bottom of some, some of these people's pockets right. and every time when we went and we talked to them but Iranian family in Israel who would want to watch that movie and then that movie, the only person who jumped in and helped us here in Los Angeles was Sharon Nazarian. God bless her. She was so sweet. She helped us. She came over there. She helped. They even brought food to the set while we were in Israel shooting, Sharon and her mom. But the thing is that that film went and won five Ophir Awards. It's like five Oscars in Israel. It was chosen as one of the top 10 best movies ever made in Israel. And Israel submitted that film as their official submissions for Oscars. So we couldn't get get the support of the community. The community didn't back us up. We had to go and do it. And somebody who, I mean, the, most of the people who invested in that movie, they have nothing to do uh, with Iran. The one of the film, uh, the film foundation in Israel, they gave us over 600,000. That's what I'm talking about. If you really want to change the way that the people are looking at us, and instead of sitting and complaining how the other, per, uh, how the other people are, are talking about us and being worried about what the other person is saying why don't we get together and tell our own stories why don't we join forces and find a couple of good stories a stories that is really represents us it tells us who we are why don't we join forces and do that there are, there are, i've read scripts about um about Darius. I've read stories about um, a, a couple of the scripts that uh, that was given to me that was about Shahnameh, about Ferdowsi, and this and yeah, that. Yeah. So this is our culture. This is what we were. But we don't join force. We don't come together to say, okay, you know what? They have their own production companies. Let us join forces. We will do, we will tell our stories and we will show our stories. And then we go and we, some of us, we go and invest in the movies that, it has nothing to do with Iran, well, and at the end, we are—I mean, we are just a pawn. What you are saying is heartbreaking, and it really resonates, Navid. And if I just take off my interviewer hat for a second and say, this program, you know, uh, started with the aim of trying to develop the connective tissue between people of Iranian descent around the world, and really committed to that. Um, you know, we need support. And I've had more than one high profile, like well known sort of people in the Iranian community say, Jianjian, uh, you know, um, your show is amazing. You should go to non Iranians 
they're going to be the ones who support this and fund it and they'll see a great opportunity. And I thought, isn't this ironic? Like that, that I have to, like the Iranians are saying, stay away from the, you know, you're not going to get, and this has been a repeated refrain, uh, Navid, uh, you know, um, uh, Hamid Rahmanian, who did that incredible Feathers of Fire uh, stage show based on the Shah Nameh. You can't mm-hmm. find an Iranian who doesn't say, oh, the Shah Nameh, it's fantastic. And, you know, and, could he he couldn't raise he, he he was having trouble raising five dollars at a time from Iranians, and ended up you know getting support from some non Iranians um, to be able to stage it. So this is something that's endemic that um, that uh, uh, speaks to not just some artists. I mean, whether Zion or Navid or Ra- Hamid or whoever wants to you know their project to be funded is not the point as much as the concern that we we in this sense seem to have trouble operating as a collective where you see other communities who are much more supportive of their uh, projects or culture or ambassadors etc right oh uh, of course you we have a um, okay you cannot find a movie a latino movie that an iranian actor would go and play a mexican guy Maybe in a very low budget film that nobody uh, nobody cares that much about, but no big uh, big budget movies. You can uh, you can find an Iranian guy who's playing a Mexican guy. Right. Okay. Um, but we have had lots of Mexican guys, Mexican actors, Latino actors who are playing Iranians. Yeah. The reason that is happening, and then people are complaining about the outcome. They said, "What?" Chi, Raptam, why, why, why would they bring a Latino guy to play an Iranian guy? Right. It's because we don't have a voice, because we are not united. We are not, we are not backing each other up. We are not helping each other. We are sitting in the back and we are always complaining without, literally, without doing anything about it. We are sitting quiet and back and say, nah, baby, oh, shit, shame on them. Why, why, why would they do that? Okay. If you want to change it, you have to be the change. You cannot sit back and say, oh, they have to change it. No, make the change happen. I mean, the same thing that happened with me. John, I'm telling you, my entire journey, I was always looked at as a guy who, this guy wants to be an actor, a Iranian guy. And I think I've done great for myself. I've done okay. I've done very good. I love my journey. I loved every step that I've taken. But for example, years ago with Reza Badi, we wanted to create a center for all the Persian, all the artists. We tried it. It didn't happen because everybody was trying to do their own thing. <laughs> yeah. Years later, it was another organization. They came to do it. They even called me. I said, okay, I'm there. Whatever you need, I'm, I'm there. They were together for a while and then it went away. I started this center, and this center was supposed to be something that's prejudice free. Everybody's welcome. Everybody's open. I asked for help. Okay, at the beginning, nothing was happening. So I, I ended up using my own money. Whatever I did, whatever I worked, all my saving is here in this place. All right? And then I started the crowdfunding. I started asking people, asking people. And then. This is the Romani Artistic Center yeah, and Studios, yes. Yes. See, what happened is that this, I already had a contract that was going, I had a seven year contract. And then some of the jobs, they fell through, especially after COVID. So now I put all my saving here because I knew that there's a there's a money coming in. And then I, it stopped because my projects got canceled. So I started and one of my friends said, go do GoFundMe. I did GoFundMe. Some of the people who came on GoFundMe and they donated money, they donated five or $10. And some of these people are PAs who worked with me on the set and they were calling me and said, Navid, I'm so sorry, I cannot do anymore. I just want to be part of this idea, part mm-hmm. of this project. I said, great, thank you so much. And some of the people who came and helped, the thing is that, for example, I heard from some people that uh, Navid is a um, Navid is a um, Navid is a charlatan. He's trying to finish his house. That's why he's trying to get money from people to finish his own house. Wow. See, for me, 
I came naked. I, I'm one. Of, I'm the last person who values money. I came naked. I will go naked. I don't care about anything. I don't care about materialistic stuff. I slept on the park bench. I can still sleep on the park bench. I don't care about it. But my hope was to do something that nobody else has ever done before, or they haven't been able to carry it all the way through. They started it, it fell. And then I ended up, I said, you know what? Fine, I don't need any help. That's why my GoFundMe is kind of silent. It's sitting there, I'm not even promoting it anymore. I don't talk to the people. I say, okay, you know what? I will do it my own way. Slowly, slowly, whatever it is, I will, I will get it done. Our problem is that we go, we complain, but we don't do anything about it. We don't we don't put our hands on on our knees and getting up and saying yo Ali and just get up and just do it yourself. I mean, um, you're complaining about the projects. Do something about it. Yeah. Go find a project. I'm not saying even working with me. Just go on your own. Go find a project. Find a story that you want to tell. Bring your friends together. Get together, find your own team, tell the story that you want to tell, and instead of sitting and complaining about other people's stories, the people can say whatever they want to say. That's their point of view. You cannot say, why are you seeing me the way that you're seeing me? Let them say, who cares? For me, I never cared what people are say about me. I just did my thing. Or the people that were saying, oh, you're too tall, you're too short, you're too fat, you're too skinny, you're, you have too much hair, you don't have hair. Well, okay, <laughs> thank you so much. That's your opinion. That's great. Thank you so much. I will go and knock on another. <laughs> right. Who's the person who said you're too fat? Because they're definitely wrong. You're <laughs> you oh, seem to have always me, been very industry, slim. In my industry, we have that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's one of the things. I, I mean, every door that... Every door that closes on your face, every door that slams on your face, okay, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that the world has come to an end. It doesn't mean that you have to stop. It doesn't mean that there is no other way for you to go. That door that slams shut is a road sign. It means that now you have to turn right or left. Here, here, brother. Yeah, I agree. You just take that and just keep going. Am I, I talking too much? I talked too no, much. No, man, it was great. That that <laughs> I, I I am so happy that you just said all that you said. I mean, uh, uh, my my one of my final questions about uh, Aladdin now seems trite. You know, it doesn't seem that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, what, how could I ask about playing the Sultan in in, in Aladdin after you've uh, you've gone to such a profound place? Um, listen, Navid uh, Negapon, it is um, it has been so good to hear um, some of the details of your journey that I actually having uh, poured through your interviews I haven't heard before from um, talking about your mom and the headscarf in Mashhad to um, to just now some of what you were saying about your a Romani Artistic Center and um, oh, and my and, mom. I'm, I'm so sorry. My mom. If you want, I can tell you stories about my mom. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have time, but I'll tell. You. That's my mom was a my mom was a my mom was my rock. She was she was a powerhouse. By the way, is your family still in Mashhad? Uh, the ones who are alive, yeah. Um, I mean, my parents they passed away. Uh -huh. um, I have a sister and a brother who. Or sort of life. Listen, I hope um, if we can get past this COVID thing um, and soon that uh, we'll we'll be able to get you in here up here in Toronto and do this uh, face to face as well. Navid, thank you for this today, man. Uh, thank you so much, John. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for your time and wishing you all the best. All the best. Stay in touch. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good office. Thank you. Actor, cultural ambassador, Navid Nigahbon. He joined us from Los Angeles, California today. Uh, that's full time for Rook today. Thanks again to Mo Rahimian and Inshufin uh, for their support for this uh, episode. Thanks to the whole Rook team, Captain Reza, Groovy Shia, Ponta, Susan, Meritad, Muhammad, the fabulous Keon. Uh, I want to go out on some music today by an artist named Emma. 
pretty sure she's in Tehran. I don't even know exactly where she is. She's 19 years old. Just did this cover of a song called Bad Boro. Came out last month. Check it out. Emma. Mizun Bashin. Don't ask that you're not home again. 